Corillo, buena, ¿cómo están todos? Antes de empezar el capítulo, quiero que sepan que tienen que ir a jaboneradongato.com Porque los jabones de Jabonera Don Gato son hechos a mano con ingredientes naturales y seguros para la piel Además que huelen súper rico, así que no se pierdan la oportunidad Especialmente porque ahora pueden ir a jaboneradongato.com Y cuando vayas a pagar, pones el código Curiosidad Científica Podcast para 10% de descuento Vamos al capítulo como dice Marie Curie, en la vida no existe nada que temer, solo cosas que comprender. Recuerden Curie buscar la manera de aprender que más le divierta. Andy Grant Tyson dice, nadie que es curioso es tonto. Las personas que no hacen preguntas permanecen ignorantes el resto de su vida. Y para ustedes, esto es curiosidad científica. Buenas Corillo de Curiosidad Científica, bienvenidos a otro episodio más de Curiosidad. Con ustedes les habla su host Agustín Valenzuela, trayéndole las maravillas del universo. Y el día de hoy tengo una persona maravillosa del universo. El día de hoy voy a hablar con una científica, PhD en biología, eh, la doctora Elizabeth Condon. Pero eh, en esta ocasión ella habla español, inglés, así que decidimos mejor hablar inglés por aquellos términos que son más fáciles de expresar eh, ¿verdad? En, en inglés que en español, pero probablemente de una que otra vez vamos a hablar de eso. Así que, Corillo, bienvenido a todo a este episodio. And welcome, Dr. Elizabeth Condon. How are you? Gracias, gracias. Muy bien. Um, sí, mi español es, es, es un, you know, más o menos como un gringa. <laughs> Soy una gringa, pero, pero estoy practicando siempre, entonces... Es... Pero la, la, la verdad es, eh, hablo más mono y, y animal que, que español. Por ejemplo, los monos araguatos, uh -huh. como... Uh, ¿Sí? Like that. Uh -huh. Ok, I got Let me look my dictionary and see if you can... Ya, ya. Pero... Um, entonces, eh, eh, estoy muy feliz para hablar sobre um, cuando un, un joven um, le gustan animales y, y no, casi no saben cual, en cualquier manera para hacer un trabajo, una carrera con animales y hay mucho más de um, solamente veterinario. Yeah, okay. Siempre cuando un joven le gustan animales, ¡ah! Seguro veterinario. veterinario, sí, sí. Pero hay mucho más oportunidades y um, para veterinarios es muy difícil para el corazón, ¿verdad? Mm -hmm. Porque es muy difícil, muy difícil, porque siempre están trabajando con animales eh, enfermos. Um, so es muy importante para una persona um, to, to know que, que saben sus limitaciones mm -hmm. y, y um, talents. Yeah. Right? Um, y para mí, um, it, igual, uh, cuando estaba un, una niña, oh, me gustan los animales siempre, mm -hmm. siempre um, tenía um, uh, una uh, uh, alguna rana o uh -huh. un culebra o uh -huh. un perro gato algo you know cualquier uh -huh. cosa um, pero después mi um, carrera my undergraduate mi primera um, universidad uh, trabajé con un parque zoológica en Cleveland Ohio en el norte uh -huh. Y con esos, um, mi primer oportunidad para trabajar con comportamiento de los animales. Okay. Y con um, estudios, con, with research, específicamente. Um, y mi, mi jefe en, en esos fue increíble en, en 
I had the chance to work with the data collection, the experimental design, um, the analysis to present results. And this was all with flamingos. Okay. <laughs> and nunca en mi vida me gustan aves. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and, and primer cosa es aves. Oh. <laughs> ah, you know, no es muy divertido. Pero después, oh, flamingos are fascinating. <laughs> really? Oh, sí, la verdad. And to, to experience just watching animals. I mean, I watched flamingos for hours and got to know them and got to see the details of their behavior and to think about why they do things mm -hmm. and how they do things and, and how they interact with the world was just so much fun. And then through that job, I had the opportunity to go to Venezuela for mm -hmm. a course. Uh, tres semanas in um, Estado Barinas, in los ya in el, el bosque tropical seco. Uh huh. And um, mi primera vez para ver monos y um, uh, now I am mixing up English and Spanish. You can you can say it in English. Don't worry, you're good. <laughs> so macaws and and monkeys and um, tracks from tapir and uh, danta and I mean just it was amazing and learned more and more about endangered species and conservation mm -hmm. and how animal behavior and conservation can work together. So we think, we tend to think about conservation in terms of saving land, protecting land, uh -huh. and stopping hunting. And those are huge, major aspects of conservation. But if you think from the animal's perspective, the most direct and the first way that an animal will respond to some change in the environment is by changing their behavior, right? Eat something different, move mm -hmm. to a new area, um, have fewer babies, have more babies, um, learn to avoid humans if they're being hunted, mm -hmm. um, change from being active during the day to being more active at night. These are all behavior responses. So by studying behavior, we can see the first effects of changes to the habitat. Oh, wow. We can see when things are starting to go wrong. And we can also plan our, um, our, our conservation activities in terms of how the animals might react, right? If that, that makes Yeah, sense. it makes a lot of sense. I was thinking, literally, you're saying that, uh, and I was talking with a paleobiologist, my friend Jorge Velez. He's one of the directors of the Museum of History in California. And uh, he discovered, um, uh, you know, some paleo, uh, you know, bones of, uh, um, not the manatee, the dudongos, he uh -huh. found some Dodongo skulls in another part of, uh, like, around Chile for, I don't know, maybe three million years ago. And and the relationship that the first ones they found, they were in the other side of Panama. And it was like, oh, so somehow they want to move down through the other side. And that probably happened three million years before, because right now there is no way to cross through Panama anymore right. because of the right. chain of the stroke. So I, I, I'm thinking about what you're saying. It's like, oh, yeah, sure. From the Caribbean, pretty much, they just moved to the other side, to the mm -hmm. Pacific. That is a little colder to the area, right. you know, in, in, in Chile. So it's I'm clicking all those. Yeah, and that can let us know that, okay, what's going to happen if the water temperature increases with climate change? Well, they could move to another area. What direction might they, we can look at those past movements 
um, to predict what might happen in the future. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's, so that's it. So I, I just became fascinated with all of that. And I, I really, through my life, I followed opportunities and I feel incredibly blessed to be able to say that they led me in the right direction, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, so <laughs> instead of going to um, school for veterinary medicine, I did a master's degree. So um, I spent uh, like what about six months in the forest in Venezuela following the primates. There mm -hmm. were three species of primates in this reserve. It was um, a forestry reserve, and okay. Reserva Forestal de Caparro. Um, and it was managed through Universidad de los Andes in Merida, Venezuela. And the they had um, capuchins, capuchinos, capuchinos uh -huh. spider monkeys, mono araña, right. and um, howler monkeys, araguato. Araguatos. Those are the smaller ones, right? Araguatos. The Araguatos or not? No, they're they're the bigger. They're the howler monkeys. So they are um they're among the larger of the new world. Okay. Um primates. The capuchins are the little ones. Oh yeah. And the really little ones are like the squirrel monkeys or the owl monkeys. Or the or the little ones. Um but uh what I looked at was how the three species were using the forest in different ways because there was a lot of pressure to log this forest. Um, and so what I was able to show is that the spider monkeys, they eat primarily fruit. So they needed, um, they needed older primary yeah, there's the, there they yeah. are. They're pretty. Yes. Look at those faces. Yeah. <laughs> the red howler monkeys. Aloata siniculus. <laughs> uh, look um, at those. They're pretty big, actually. Look at this one in the branch. <laughs> yes, yes. They are pretty big. And they and you can you know see some of them when they're howling and doing the the there's they can scare the yeah, they can scare the heck out of you when you oh, for sure. <laughs> all of a sudden you start howling. Um, How close the, have you been to one of those? I'm sorry that I interrupt you. Oh, no, it's fine. So actually one did, one was in a tree and I didn't see it and I was right underneath it and it started howling and oh yeah, I scary. about <laughs> jumped out of my skin. But they are, they are, the howler monkeys just howl at you. Mm -hmm. the, the spider monkeys will throw things at you and try to pee on you. <laughs> yeah, they are kind of the, the, the as we would say, hoodlums, you know, they're the, the naughty teenagers of the forest. And then the capuchins usually just run, um, just get out of there. But so there, it's interesting how different they are in their behavior. Um, and one thing is that, so the spider monkeys prefer to eat fruit. Mm -hmm. And so they like older forests that has healthy fruiting trees, tends to be tall and fairly dense forest. So once logging starts, the spider monkeys will be the first to disappear. Mm -hmm. Now, the capuchins, they are omnivorous. They're, they will eat fruit. They'll eat insects. They'll eat some leaves, a little bit of everything. So because they are more general in their diet, um, when they are the last to disappear, if the forest, so, and, and if you cut down a forest for logging, but allow it to regrow, mm -hmm. the capuchins will be the first to return. Mm -hmm. And then the howler monkeys are kind of in between. Howler monkeys eat a lot of leaves. They're, they eat more leaves than any other um, of the monkeys in the new world. That means two things. One, they, they tend to sit and digest a lot, right? Plants are harder to digest. Yeah, it takes longer. They tend to sleep a lot. <laughs> that also makes them easier targets. For prey. Yeah. And well, 
They taste good. Oh, how you try it? Yeah. So it's in it, and it's it's interesting and sad, but um depending on what area you're in and what plants, what species of plants the monkeys are eating, they have different flavor. Oh, really? So what the locals would tell me is like, oh yes, the, the howler monkeys in this area are, you know, oh sabroso. Like I would uh -huh. say, ah, me gusta mucho los monos, and ah, sabroso. And I'm like, no, uh, no, no, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, but of course, I mean, I eat cow, so what? I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just a different, you know, different difference in culture, but um. Different so or... one of the things I was able to say with my master's thesis is, okay, this forest has been logged, but that does not mean that it's done forever or that it can't come back. If you allow it to regrow, first the capuchins will return, then the howler monkeys will come back. And if it's left long enough, the spider monkeys could come back. So whereas you know, some of the attitude was, well, once it's cut, we might as well keep cutting it. We might as uh, well, you know, turn it into a farm, right? Well, not necessarily. We can still, you know, there's still some hope for that area. So that was really it. And that was like my first experience of being able to really have a useful aspect to what I was setting, right? Some way I could say, okay, here's some information that I found myself and it could help. And that was just so, um, so exciting and so empowering that I could contribute. For sure. Know? And, and, you know, maybe help make a difference. So then I, um, <laughs> I was doing um, an internship actually trying to figure out, well, now what? What do I want to do mm -hmm. next? And um, I always tell my students, the, the trick is to take what you enjoy doing, what you're good at, and find a way to match. Put it together. The thing you want to do most, you might not be good at, mm -hmm. but there's gonna be, hopefully there's gonna be some overlap <laughs> there, right? Well, I was doing this internship and my boss turned to me one day and said, you know, every time you talk about the tropics and tropical forests, your face lights up uh -huh. and you really want to be the boss. Yeah, you, you want to go to the field. <laughs> so, so he said, go get a PhD. And I'm like... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge of <laughs> okay. And um, I never at that time did not think that I would be a teacher. I thought I wanted to do just the research mm -hmm. side of it. But while I was in school for my PhD, I taught to help pay for it mm -hmm. and discovered that I'm, I'm a, pretty good teacher. And so that's kind of where that, what I like and what I was good at came together mm -hmm. because by being a university teacher, that enabled me to do more research. And of course, it's always fun to do things you're good at and not fun to do things you're bad at. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I did, I, I found that I really enjoy teaching um, because it's, it's like this. It's it's talking about what I love. It's sharing, you know, what I what I love to do. And so um I've been really, really lucky. I, I now am at a small university in Daytona Beach, Florida, that is um an HBCU, a historically black college. Mm -hmm. um, and uh being from Florida, some of your listeners may be familiar with Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. She is um, an African American woman who started this university in 1904. Oh and wow! Very influential figure in the civil rights movement in the U.S. and um, was just basically a a force of nature unto wow. herself. And so she now is represented by a statue in Washington D.C. 
Every state has two statues in this hall of statues in, in D.C., and she's the first African-American woman in the hall of statues in D.C., Wow. So, so that's her school. <laughs> yeah, but that that's I, I think like we have our own Marie Curie here because she was kind of the same years, 1900s. She, she's awesome. So um yeah, so I'm at Bethune Cookman University in Daytona Beach. I've been here for about 12 years. Um, but that's I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. My when I went back to school to do my mm -hmm. doctorate, mm -hmm. I didn't know what exactly I wanted to study, but I knew that I wanted to go back to the tropics, that I wanted to do something with behavior that was connected to conservation, but I didn't want to study primates again because I didn't want to be an anthropologist. Okay. So anthropologists tend to study primates in order to understand just primates or to understand humans. I don't care about humans. <laughs> 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 it's not my, it's not my thing. There are plenty of people out there who are. There is a lot, a, a, a billion, a billion of them, and and a yeah. lot of them are. I cannot say the word. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so I was looking for sort of what my next thing would be. I happened to, um, meet and work with a professor from Venezuela who then had a colleague who still taught in Venezuela at Universidad Simón Bolívar in Caracas. Mm. Um, and he studied capybara, chigüires in Venezuela. And at first, like, oh, rodents? <laughs> rodents and, and a giant rodent? Well, I, oh. <laughs> but then he, his name is um, Emilio Herrera. And um, he was like the capybara guy at the time. And um, he, uh, he was working in the field, but wanted to shift more towards working in the lab. Well, I wanted to work in the field without having to work in the lab. So we mm -hmm. were sort of this perfect match. See, aren't they adorable as babies? They're so cute. They look so cute. For those of you who don't know what a capybara is, you probably have seen a lot of videos in the internet and people now have like these pets that they look like a big uh, guinea pig, like really big, like dog-sized guinea pig. They're pretty, pretty big, but we, we will talk about them a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, and they are, they're, they are very, they're closely related to guinea pigs, but yeah, much bigger. And um, so this was like a perfect collaboration, right? This Emilio did the lab work for their genetics and mm -hmm. looking at some of the diseases that impact them. And then I was in the field looking at behavior. And once I got to know them better and got to understand um, more about them, oh, then I I was hooked. They, they actually, they called me La Reina de los Tigres. <laughs> La Reina. The queen, yes. I was the uh -huh. queen of the capybara. Uh -huh. And it was um in in Venezuela specifically, um, they are harvested, they're part of a managed harvest. So each year around um Lent, around Semana Santa, mm -hmm. they are harvested. Ranches can get permission to take 20% of the of their total number of capybaras on their oh, land. Wow. So, and because they are territorial, they don't really try to run away. So if, if you know, if you own a cattle ranch and you have, you protect your land to protect your cows, then you are automatically protecting any capybara that are there, right? If you just don't kill them, they'll pretty much be there. Oh, forever. <laughs> And he, and and they they breed. They actually can have up to eight or nine babies with one litter. Wow, which that's is a lot. lot which that's is a, a lot, lot for an animal that size. Yeah, they the average is about four, but they can you know they can get up to eight or nine. Um, and the the value 
per kilo, they are worth more than beef. Oh, wow. So they're tasty too. Yes. So they eat grass. So they taste like cow. Oh, basically. wow. But, but a very lean, like if you ever buy, you know, expensive grass fed meat at the grocery store, this, mm -hmm. that's like capybara. It's, I, I will confess I did taste it once. You have to do it. I, well, I was in someone's home and it was offered to me. And again, I would say I like capybaras and they're like, oh, sabnoso. <laughs> <laughs> the queen of but, capybaras um, is eating capybaras. Yeah, so, and it's, and it was, you know, during the legal harvest mm -hmm. and everything. And so, and then once, once the local people got to know me, they would make me tuna fish whenever they were. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they understood. Um, but they're just, well, so back to the harvest in Venezuela, um, during Semana Santa, when the people are not eating meat, mm -hmm. right, but they can eat, but Catholics can eat fish. Fish, yeah. Well, capybaras spend a lot of time in the water. And so in the year 1784, when an explorer from Spain was exploring Venezuela and described capybaras back to the Pope, the Pope said, well, they spend a lot of time in water. So basically they're fish and they're you can fish. eat them. <laughs> yes. Los nombraron peces. <laughs> they call these pescado peces. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. So, um, so they, they became a traditional meal during Semana Santa, during Lent in oh, Venezuela. Oh, what a trick. Yeah. I'm going to start calling cows fish. Like, <laughs> no, now you can't, you can't cows. Cows don't like water that much. You got to get God. a capybara. <laughs> God, what if they get in the mud? Can I eat that on <laughs> Semana Santa? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's craziness. It's, it's craziness. But the... The good thing about it is that um, because they're managed and so the people um, only take 20 percent and it is regulated, the capybaras in Venezuela are still a healthy population. Okay. Um, what's interesting, though, is they're a healthy population where they are managed. So within protected areas or within cattle ranches where the owners are protecting them from poachers. But if you go out, once you're outside the limits of those areas, you almost never see one. Because mm. as the economy has struggled, people are hungry. So people will eat what they can find, right? Of course. Um, and so then you look at, um, other areas within Latin America where they're not managed and in some areas it is legal to kill them and they are more threatened in that particular area. And then in Brazil, where it's illegal to kill them, they are protected. They're almost overpopulated. Mm. Like people actually complain sometimes about them getting into crops and eating crops or eating people's pretty flower bed or things like that. So it's a really interesting example and way to look at how hunting and harvesting can impact the population. That is what I would like to do if I could go back and continue studying them. Mm -hmm. I, that's one of the things I would like to look at is their behavior, how their behavior differs in places where they are hunted and places where they are not. Yeah, because they probably could be like more aggressive or or not that friendly. Because I was listening to uh uh you know the, the way I contact you was because I listened to you in another uh, uh show and I remember you said like they're not like super friendly, but they're not, you know, at least where you in the area you were, they didn't feel threatened by you. Exactly. So they were kind of chill. And they and if you see the pictures, they're chill with like 
gators next to them, birds on top of them. Like they don't really care too much. So maybe, yeah, it could be like a difference in, in that. Hmm. Exactly. Well, and yeah, so I, I laugh because the um the movie Encanto, the cartoon, uh -huh. Encanto has a capybara in it. Oh. And he's totally capybara. He like doesn't care about anything. He just sits there. Things are going on around him. It's totally, they, they got it right. They got it right. Yes, like um, they don't care. They're like yeah. stoners. They're just yeah. going around. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Um. So yes, that would be really interesting. What I what I actually studied for my doctorate was um, natal dispersal. So what that means is when young ones grow up, if they stay with their parental group, stay in the social group where they were born, or if they leave. And what I found is that the males will leave, but the females will stay. So when you look at a social group, the females tend to be all related to one another. They're moms and sisters and aunts, but the males are not because the males are moving from group to group. Hmm. And this way they avoid inbreeding. Oh, so is it something like the species kind of thought about, like, you know, like kind well, of human way or it's just... Basically, what happens over evolutionary time, the capybaras that did not leave and they stayed and mated with their close relative, they had unhealthy babies oh, and those wow. babies did not survive. So the only capybaras that survived were the ones that left to find mates that were not closely related. So now, thousands of years later, what we see are the ones that survived, the ones that did it by moving out. And, and you can imagine, right, if the males are leaving, but the females are staying home, then the risk of mating accidentally with your sister is low because you left. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, that's putting a lot of human qualities yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to make it easier to explain, but that's the idea. And, but that's um, pretty impressive because I I'm thinking like what about like maybe uh this male that you know that's with this uh, uh, other capybara they have babies those those males stay the father with that new or he also just I got you pregnant I'm leaving too again. No, so once that once an adult is in a group, they tend to stay there. Oh, okay. Once an adult male is in a group, they tend to stay there. But the young ones, the young ones leave. are the ones living. Now what's interesting what again like my next study right i have all these dreams of what i would study. you next. will do it i know <laughs> you will do it we'll um, be talking about this in two years <laughs> <laughs> um is how a young male capybara enters introduces himself to a new group mm, right interesting so too how does, yeah how does a young usually capybara males are like um i'm literally reading one book right now it's called Alpha God. So yes. <laughs> if you read it, you know what, what my question was going to be. like. The... Well, exactly. And, and capybaras are like that. Male capybaras have a dominance hierarchy. So they have an alpha male that and the alpha male gets most of the opportunities to mate in that social group. Although the subordinate males, they sneak around and they get mm -hmm. they get opportunities too. But they have to sneak around. <laughs> but, um, but, and they do defend a territory. So my, my, my collaborator, Emilio Herrera, he actually saw two groups of capybaras kind of have almost like a gang war oh, yeah. when they got too close and they were fighting, right? So <laughs> they can be very aggressive. Oh, wow. So again, how does a young male break into get into this new group and i mean i i think of it like you know how do capybaras date uh -huh. <laughs> right? they don't have tinder <laughs> you know and i mean it's all grass it's everywhere it's not like taking a you know taking a capybara out to dinner isn't a big deal it's grass uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just bring her you know some dead animal uh -huh. um so but what i think is that it has to do with 
them, the young animal sort of stays at the outside of the social group and kind of gets them used to his smell, right? If So capybaras, they have a scent gland on their nose called mm -hmm. the morillo, little hill morillo. Mm -hmm. and, and they use that to scent mark. They have this like white milky secretion that <laughs> and it's kind of gross, I know. <laughs> but it's not it's not gross if you're a capybara. And, of course. <laughs> and so by I think by my hypothesis is that by scent marking around this new group, they get the new group used to their smell. And then and because they are young, they're not seen as a threat as much as another adult would be seen as a threat. So I think part of the process is that they have to move when they're young enough to not be a, a high threat, threat yeah. to the alpha male of the group. It will be a, a big difference between like the time that a, a, a young capybara gets to the actual normal size, it, it, or it will be a big difference maybe in the shape of the nose or something for has, like the older ones to the younger ones. So they take about... Um, two to two and a half years to get to full size. And they tend to, the, the average age when they will leave leave home is about 18 months. Oh, so that's they leave why home when they're, when, they're, when they're big enough that they can survive on their own and not be food for every, you know, Thing. snake mm -hmm. and bird of prey that's out there. But, um, but when they're still a little bit smaller than an adult male. Yeah. Um, and we've also seen that like they may try to follow and they may try to follow a female, but the females won't let them mate with them yet. The females mm. will brush them off. Even the Just younger the females, they all know. Even even the younger females, they don't like the little males. They don't like the little uh, males. Like, no, you you weakling. Go exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Because, you know, in biology, size always matters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you hopefully have some uh, dance yeah. moves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You got to know how to scent mark just the right way. Yeah, yeah. Even even like uh, we went to uh, Portugal not long ago. Uh, and, and in this castle, there, is, there was this uh, 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 pavo real. Um, mm -hmm. And... I didn't knew that. That was my wife who told me. I know that's the male, the one with the beautiful feathers and all that. That's the male. The ugly one. That's the womb, the female. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, usually you have, you need something. If you're a male, you need something to attract woman. In, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's a whole other talk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I I love where we're going, but I I don't want to uh, uh, lose a few points because. I love the story. I love the capybara, but I have so much more questions that I have at the <laughs> beginning. Just Be starting glad, with, glad. yeah, yeah. Uh, just starting like uh, you decide to study uh, um, birds first. Like, what do you notice on those birds that that it was like a click for you? Like, oh wow, they're not just like in one leg. I'm being pink in a corner. They do something <laughs> specifically. That you say like, yeah. oh, this is kind of interesting. What was that first thing when you start observing, in this case, uh, uh, this bird, that you realize, okay, they're doing something that I wasn't expecting? So this, because I was working at a zoo, mm. what, what prompted the research was that the flamingos were not having babies. Okay. So, and the zoo wanted to know why, what was wrong that they weren't having babies they would lay eggs but the egg would get lost or broken and wouldn't hatch so um flamingos they build um a mound of mud to nest so they build like little um hills to put their nest on and mm -hmm. then the pair will defend that nest and will you know like peck at other birds that get too get close, close. Mm -hmm. so our first question was whether or not we had them in too small of an area and so that they were nesting too close and there was so much fighting that maybe the eggs were getting broken. 
And we, we noticed, yeah, that there was a lot of fighting and over the nests and that was causing some of the eggs to get lost. And so then we asked, well, are the males or the females being more aggressive? But it's hard to tell a male from a female flamingo just okay, by looking yeah. at them. Yeah. So we pulled feathers that would have a little blood at the tip of the feather and we could look at their, um, do the blood work. Well, we had um, 36 flamingos, 15 nesting pairs. So six of the flamingos were either too young or whatever makes a flamingo ugly. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't paired up. And so we had 15 nests with 30 birds. But when we looked at the analysis, we only had 12 females. So of these 15 nests, nine of them had a male and a female. Six of them, one third, six of them, sorry, one third, yeah, six of them had a male and a male, two males. Uh huh. Now, and in the second year of the study, the only couple that hatched an egg and raised a young bird was two dads. Oh, wow. You see, in nature. Right? Now, so what we discovered, now, two males were never seen attempting to copulate. They never attempted to have sex. And, of course, biologically, you have to have a female in there. Yeah, to you have to egg. have a female. Well, but what they did is they stole a nest and an egg from another couple and then raise the chick. So it would appear more work is done to figure all this out, but it would appear that the drive to have a nest and to have an egg was like disconnected from the drive to have sex. Oh, wow. Having sex is one thing, but regardless of whether or not there's a sexual partner, the male had the motivation to have a nest with an egg. And because males are naturally a little bit more aggressive, aggressive than females, yeah. right? If you have two males defending a nest, they are likely to be better at defending that nest than a male and a female. Hmm. And probably me thinking in here, probably that was one of the main points why it was so hard to uh, uh, hatch an egg because probably more than one couple of males or even a single male was trying to get one nest and they just get into exactly. arguments uh, doing quotes in the air arguments uh, and were breaking the egg until a couple of them just realized okay you and me can collaborate in this one oh yeah. wow yeah wow. so um so then what the zoo did once we figured all this out the zoo then traded six i think six males for six females with another zoo to balance out the sex ratio in their group okay because ultimately the goal for zoos is to have the animals breed in the zoo so that mm -hmm. no more and not take any animals from the from the wild mm -hmm. and so figuring out this but i yeah so that for me that was that was my That's first pretty impressive your behavior research it was very cool that's pretty impressive because you see this beautiful pink bird and you don't know that they can just you know, kick ass <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly they're very wow. bad they're they're serious dads yeah mm -hmm. wow that's pretty awesome and then uh uh forwarding a little bit not too much i love uh the conservation part especially when you were talking about uh, uh the monkeys um in general uh, you said that the area in that forest in Venezuela, it was pretty damaged or still you could have been able to fix it if you wanted. Like we all know we can probably fix our planet, but uh, um, those areas were already, you know, you know, like the monkeys just uh, move away from that area already. So, no, this was a, res a forestry reserve. Oh, so okay. it was being studied and preserved for um, for studying the, the trees and the plants. And then because the it was the forestry department of the university that was running it. Um, and then they were actually 
and this is where I say I just I have been so lucky because when when I was there the first time as part of a course, they were looking for someone to come in and study the monkeys so that they could develop their next draft of their conservation plan with more knowledge of the primates in the area. And so it was just the right timing. Um, but the surrounding area was had all been logged. And of course, there was always trouble with illegal encroachment and oh, those to outside there. areas kind of getting closer. And But the advantage that I had is that the area had been so well studied in terms of the forest that I knew which parts of the forest. I had a map of where it was dense, tall, primary, regrowth, um, whether it was um, bajio or bajo, whether it was mm -hmm. a little higher or lower, so that yeah. was wetter soil. Alto, alto, bajo. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so I was able to kind of put all those things together with what the primates preferred. Wow, that's pretty impressive. And let me ask you this. What would happen? Like where, you know, because uh, South America, right? Venezuela is in South America. Do you think they will move like more to the south, to the colder weather or more to the north? Maybe Panama or, or something. I don't know. Well, that's the problem is that whenever we're talking about species having to move, they are then going to be coming in contact with other new species species that they're going to compete with. And that's where it becomes dangerous is that we say, yeah, okay, if the species can just move to avoid, but what happens more likely is no, they actually die out. Yeah. So the spider monkeys in that area are a critically endangered species. And the howler monkeys, I believe, are listed as threatened um right now i haven't checked in a while what their current status is but that's the sad thing because in panama there already are sp a different species of spider monkey and capuchin and oh. owls in panama and so there's really not room for more oh yeah yeah that's that that's that, 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 for just one second yeah yeah that's oh, okay. my foot fell asleep i'm just on a zoom call can you come back in about 15 minutes 15. or tomorrow? 15? Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. I'm, um, it's, it's time for students to sign up for classes for next okay. semester <laughs> and I'm an academic advisor. So they tend to just drop by. <laughs> okay. That's pretty cool. Actually. That's pretty cool. He's going to, he's going to come back. Okay. Nice. Then I, I uh, yeah, cause I, I was thinking about that cause there is a huge problem. Um, Maybe you can tell me because you work in this. Because um, sometimes when people talk about, uh, uh, you know, hunters uh, or, or things like that, and I have read a lot of information that it is not always bad. You know, like if somebody goes and hunts certain species because there is a lot of uh, invasive species. So if it may be the, the primates that move from Venezuela will die if, with the primates in Colombia. But there is a lot of uh, invasive uh, uh, animals, like, like let's say, like pigs and hawks. They they exactly. don't really have some right. some other animal that can kill them, or maybe some bears that are in certain areas that will kill the deer. And right. and you know, and it, that's it, the and so there's there's two sides. Well, so for instance, in um in Brazil right? Where the capybaras in some areas, there's too many capybaras mm -hmm. because they breed so well. And so there have been some discussion, well, maybe sometimes we should yeah. cull, is what we call it, culling some of the animals so that the population stays healthy. Um, in the U.S., we do this with the deer population. Mm -hmm. um, particularly, you know, I'm from Ohio in the north, and there's, um, if the deer are not Hunted because we have destroyed so much of their habitat, there's not enough room for all of them anymore. And their natural predators, the wolves and things are pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. And so we have to kill some of them to keep the rest healthy or they can get overpopulated and then disease spreads. Mm -hmm. The challenge is educating the public so that they know which animals um, can safely be taken and which not. And the seasons. And, 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. And in particular, if you have, you know, people that are hungry, then that's a whole other, like, how, how do you, how do you, the first thing we have to do is make sure that the people have what they need mm -hmm. to survive mm -hmm. or the animals are never going to. Yeah, because that's one thing that you just mentioned, like in Brazil, usually I ha I have zero knowledge of Brazil. And I know most uh, countries, they have a pretty rich uh, money people, um, regular people side, but usually they have a, another side that is really poor. And my understanding, and I could be completely wrong in this, is like there are some areas in Brazil that are really poor. So mm -hmm. if you think about an animal that you could, uh, uh, you know, like, like take care of 20, 25 percent of them one time a year, that's a lot of uh, it's a, it's taste a lot of, of steaks for, exactly. you know. Exactly. And that is and it's. And some of that, too, is just the cultural aspect of people. So I think about it here in the United States. We sort of joke sometimes about eating roadkill, right? When so out, you know, if you see someone hits a um, hits a deer in the road, right? Well, you're going to pick that deer up and make it for dinner. Yeah, not right? a lot of and people will joke, do it. No, we joke about that. But at the same time, if you're hungry enough, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that deer is food. Yeah. Right. And so for here, it's deer. In other places, that the same would apply to capybara or, you know, what are in. Um, and that's where we have to be really, I think, careful and really aware of cultural differences in terms of I can't go into an area and say, oh, capybaras are awesome. You should not eat them. It's mm -hmm. wrong to eat capybara. How, who am I to? I mean, yeah. other other cultures would would tell me that I'm very wrong for eating cow. Yeah. And so we have to be understanding of the cultural um, component and the economic. You know, how hungry are you? How it's it gets very complicated very quickly. Yes. Um, and requires a lot of communication and understanding among people. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think uh, it is good that we live in the states, and um, but uh, we have zero idea of other cultures. Like literally, I was watching the other day one documentary, and in this part in, in Africa, they literally just catch bugs in the air and they mix it with something and they do burgers out of bugs because mm -hmm. uh, they have a lot of protein. But mm -hmm. uh, you would never think in here that you just get that, you know, like your net and catch flies and just create mm -hmm. a burger with that. Uh, you will never think about that. But right. there is nothing else to eat there. You cannot even grow stuff in some areas. And and who knows? Maybe it tastes good. Probably. I'm Puerto yeah, Rican. I, I know if you put some adobo, some sofrito, <laughs> ahí, it's going to be good. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it can all be fixed up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <Let's... laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we're pretty, we're, we're pretty, you know, lucky. I, I should say, I should say that, that, and that, and that's something that we need to think more about. I'm, I'm probably will be a little bit more humble and try to understand even our neighbor. Um, and, and honestly, I would say that I think that um, I am, one of my dream, one of my dreams is to create a course that would take undergraduate students from the U.S. to um, Latin America um, or to Africa or other just places that are so culturally different mm -hmm. that it's just really impossible to imagine it without living it for at least a couple weeks. And I think it would be such an incredible learning experience mm -hmm. and opening of communication and cultural acceptance and everything else. But unfortunately, so many of our students have so much trouble paying for school itself that they can't afford to take these, you know, study abroad opportunities. So um, I'm looking for ways that I could finance something like that a la and and actually, I'll do a shameless plug right now for. Oh, you have to! You a, have to. <laughs> I have a nonprofit that I created called 
BEC research, B-E-C, B-E-C, um, that it stands for Behavioral Ecology and Conservation. And um, I can send you the link. And yes, I, I will I, put it in the show notes. Yeah. I um I need to get the donate button working, but it should be it should be functional within the next couple weeks. And that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to raise money so that students can have research opportunities and um, study abroad opportunities and things like that. So yeah, we, we only have a couple minutes left. So I'm going to do a quick note about my current research. Mm -hmm. So um, being at a small school, it's difficult to do international research. So I was looking for something local. So I work with what we call the, the bully breeds at the local animal shelter. So pit bulls, Staffordshire Terriers, boxers, things like that. Um, the, the big dogs, right? The uh -huh. big, fun, some beautiful, scary beautiful. <laughs> dogs. Yes, they're gorgeous. And we do different training and enrichment with them to help them have a better quality of life in the shelter, which then helps them to remain calm and to have less anxiety and then be easier to adopt nice. because an anxious, nervous, scared dog in a shelter is not going to be a dog that someone wants to take home, but it's also not their normal, natural personality. They don't, if you imagine, you know, when you, if you were in jail, you would not be behaving like your normal loving self. Yeah. And you don't know where you are. You're just suddenly appearing. Oh, where am I? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So um, that's where I was in the lab today is um, analyzing. We collect saliva from the dogs and analyze it for cortisol, which is the stress hormone mm -hmm. to see if what we're doing with them is helping them to is lowering their stress by seeing if it lowers their hormones levels. Nice. And so far we've been um, we've been able to show that playing with dogs in a really interactive way, just 10 minutes a day is enough to lower their stress and they jump less and they bark less. And so I'm really hopeful that, and so everyone out there, I would encourage you to adopt a dog, do not buy a dog mm -hmm. <laughs> and keep an open mind with shelter dogs because they are not necessarily behaving like themselves when you see them in the shelter. Wow, that's great. That's great. Elizabeth Condon. Elizabeth, this has been an honor. Hopefully we can have you back here. Hopefully if those other programs that you're planning on doing, I can help a little bit more with that. Uh, I will put all the links for all the listeners to click and go there and help you. So you have the BEC uh, research program mm -hmm. and then the organization the dog organization name is that's so um it's you can also donate through the same vet research okay. um or if you just donate to your local shelter okay that's great this they has been amazing thank you elizabeth thank you i hope you everybody so uh, uh listening uh can go where, where they can find you maybe they can go to your page or something um, if, if you go to the Beck research page, I'm the founder of it. So there's information about me. Um, and I'm, I'm working on making it better. <laughs> if you, if you Google my name, you'll find more stuff about capybaras. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or you can go to your, whatever, TikTok, Instagram, and put capybara. You will see a lot of them jumping in the bathtub. So <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Y como siempre, recuerden siempre buscar la manera de aprender que más le divierta. Chequeamos. Bye, bye. Gracias. Y para ustedes, esto es Curiosidad Científica.